Welcome back to Open Relationships. My name is Andrea Miller. I'm your host along with my co-host Joanna Schroeder and our producer Brian Adkins. We have an incredible guest on today. His name is Case Kenny and we talk through how being true to yourself is sincerely a superpower. And don't just take my word for it. This is pre-approved by none other than Snoop Dogg and John Cena. So let me introduce Case Kenny. Oh my gosh, I am so excited to introduce our guest, Case Kenny. Case is a mindfulness expert, entrepreneur, social media superstar, and host of the Top 25 Apple podcast, New Mindset, Who Dis? Beloved by some of today's biggest celebrities, including Haley Bieber, Sophia Bush, and John Cena, you might recognize Case's work from his viral coffee cup and posted quotes on Instagram, you know, the red and white ones which have been shared by millions and featured across the media landscape, including Forbes, Good Morning America, and The Today Show, and many others. Case is also the creator of a set of best-selling mindfulness journals, including But First, Inner Peace, and is the author of the wonderful book that I just finished, That's Bold of You. Welcome, Case. Thanks for being on Open Relationships. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. It's a very kind intro. Yeah. Okay, let's start with your book, That's Bold of You. You have a message that certainly resonated with me and is critical to just about everybody, it feels like these days, and I would say especially to young people, and that's simply a mandate to be true to yourself. Why is that so important to you? Yeah, I mean, I I think of, of all the things that we find challenging in life, whether that's dating or our career or our health and fitness or friendships or whatever, I think really at the crux of that is at some point we distance ourselves from our true self. And our true self is is a vague term, right? What does that mean? I think it could take a long time in life to, to find your true self. I think my true self when I was 20 is way different than my true self now at 36. I think what I'm so passionate about is the application of mindfulness throughout the process, throughout the process of living and loving and learning. And at any given point to say, Do I have a why behind my actions? Do I have a point of view? And can I just be sure at this point, I'm not borrowing. I'm not copying and pasting someone else's belief systems or timeline or expectation. And I think to do that, to have a mindset of that, I think it's a bold thing, which is why I called the book, That's Bold of You. It's a bold thing to challenge expectations. It's the bold thing to challenge identities. Like if someone someone called you, you're too loud or too quiet or you're too this or too that. It's a bold thing to say, Thanks for your opinion. Just because you say it doesn't mean it's true. And it's also a bold thing to challenge yourself. Like we're also very critical of ourselves. I could look at myself and say, Case, you're an imposter. Oh, why should anyone listen to you? It's a bold thing to say, no, I'm not going to agree with that statement. So, you know, yeah, the, the book is, uh, you know, it's about identities. It's about reinventing your identity to stay true to yourself over time. Um, and I think, you know, of all the things we could do in our lives that will help minimize regret that is looking back and being like, man, I really wasn't true to myself. Uh, it's it's that. So, yeah, certainly a subject I'm very passionate about um, and think, uh, you know, we should all pay attention to. So is that where it showed up for you first was you, you just said that you heard an inner voice that was saying you're an imposter. Is that where you first had your challenge or was that somewhere else? Oh man. Well, many challenges. I, I would say like the, the, the real, the reason I got into mindfulness and self-development, you know, I never had any inclination. I was never like, I never felt that I was like overly spiritual or overly uh, mindful or, you know, connected with myself. I never, you know, you know, in my twenties was like, I'm going to do what I do now. I, I think what really was the catalyst for all this for me was in my late twenties, I just felt like there were a lot of versions of myself. There was, um, I worked in advertising for a long time and I, you know, started as an account executive and worked my way up to regional vice president. And I was like, man, I really like who, you know, professional leader manager case is like confident. He takes clients out. He does sales things. He leads a team, whatever. I was like, I like that person, but I just felt a distinct difference between that person and like my inner case person. Like one was super confident, the other one wasn't. One was like, oh no, this is what you do. The other one was like, I don't know anything. I'm just borrowing and rushing. 
So I just felt like there were a lot of different versions of myself. And I didn't like that fact as a very type A person. I was like, I really don't like the fact that I feel like I'm one person here, another there. I feel like I kind of blend into who I'm talking to. And I was like, man, I really don't like that fact. That feels wrong. Um, so I actually started the podcast in response to that feeling. And I was like, I want to be the same person in any scenario. I want to be the same person in and out. I don't want to live my life where I'm prioritize, prioritizing how it looks to other people. I want to focus on how it feels to me. So I literally just started the podcast on a whim um, where I would sit down with no guests. And for 15 or 20 minutes, I would just force myself to have a point of view and say, here is my point of view and here's where it's coming from so that I can ensure that it's true to me. Um, and then, of course, you know, through doing that, um, I realized what I was doing, which is mindfulness, putting my feelings on trial, practicing presence and acceptance, and then, you know, working on kind of, um, you know, affirmations for myself. Um, and that was 600 episodes ago. So <laughs> over time, well, of course, I think I've, I've to... grown a lot. Welcome to the type A party. Andrea and I call ourselves the triple uh, A Aries. Yeah, type triple A Aries. Exactly. <laughs> well, I want to pick up on that because uh, you are clearly an overachiever. I've been sleuthing. I've been I've been a little a little cringy. You encourage us to be cringy, so I'm going to be cringy. <laughs> love the cringe. I love all the permission you're given. Um, no, but in all seriousness, you speak five languages. No joke. And it's not just like oh, like the easy ones. It's Urdu, Hindi. Mandarin, Arabic, and English. You started multiple businesses. You have built yourself into a super successful brand. You have a top podcast and so much more. So what I'm wondering is, do you feel like the message that you're giving to others came from a place where you felt like you needed to prove yourself? Did you feel like you had to um, show that you were enough? Like, is this a catalyst to to saying, hey, I, I not only am I going to do all these things and be super successful, but I'm actually going to um, really out myself by insisting on on being true. I mean, because that and I could be projecting a little or a lot, but I am really curious when I look at your background, I go, oh, wow. OK, yeah. Well, I appreciate that. I mean, you just listed the things I'm proud of. Uh, you didn't Yay. list the things okay, I'm good. not good at and the long list of things that I failed at. I mean, you didn't list the fact that, you know, when I went to college, I started off as pre-med and just got blown out of the water. And I was like, I'm going to do something else <laughs> Then shift it over to Chinese. Oh, that Arabic. was my so, next I mean, question. All your failures. No, just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, how much time do you have? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, certainly, uh, you know, those are and those are the things I'm I'm proud of. And, you know, I've always been type A and I'm an Aries as well. So, I mean, I've always been. <sighs> With blue eyes. We're going to come back to blue eyes. But OK, we're for those of you who are not watching, who are just listening, we're having a, a blue eyes type triple A Aries party here. OK, but you're all invited. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad I'm in good company. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I've always, you know, and I've always wanted to do well. Like I remember when I, I took my first job out of college. Um, that had nothing to do with Chinese or Arabic or any language. I, I started working in, in marketing and uh, it was a good job. It was a good entry level job, but it, it, it made, you know, just above minimum wage if you netted everything out. So I was making no money. And I remember at one point, um, so I was at an ad agency. So a lot of young people, big brands, really fun and vibrant, but you didn't make any money. Um, it's just the way the kind of industry worked. But I remember looking around and there were people on the other side. So like we were an agency and did advertising things. These technology companies like Facebook or Google would come in and sell us their technology and we would use it for clients. And I remember meeting those people. They were just like me. We're in the same industry, but they were making 10 times, 20 times what I was making. I was like, man, I want to make that. I was like, we're doing the same thing. Why don't I make more money? So eventually I started to do what they did. But it was a really interesting transition for me because I... I in my early 20s, I was super, to my point, kind of introverted, which isn't a bad thing, but I was kind of shy, um, also unsure, very like, oh, traditional career paths, do this, do that. So I didn't really have a point of view of myself. But moving into that sales role and then doing that for like eight, nine years, it, it changed my point of view on everything. I was like, man, I could start at zero and build something. I can do these things. So it really changed my point of view such that then I started doing the podcast and I was like, wow, this, this feels really good. I feel like more sure of myself as a man and as identity. And then eventually I was like, well, you know, why don't I start to like build things and create things and like be successful in this and maybe leave that behind. So it kind of was like a cascading thing of just proof 
like we, we talk about confidence, right? Confidence comes from evidence. Confidence isn't just a belief, it's evidence-based. And I think, you know, my late 20s was evidence, evidence, evidence into my early 30s. And then I left my job when I was 30, uh, 33, uh, 33, 34, somewhere in there. Um, and ev eventually it was just like, wow, I've proven so many times that I could do something I have no business doing and do well at it because I joke with my girlfriend a lot that I, this is a joke, but I always say that I have the it factor, which is I'm just too stubborn to ever quit. Um, and well, that's, I a, think that's, that's an Aries trait. Me. That's an Aries trait. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Perhaps it's just stubbornness and not the it factor. It's all about the branding. Uh, but yeah, I think it was somewhere along the way, I was like, man, I've got this evidence. I've got this thing where if I want something, I'll keep going at it. And eventually I think anyone with that mentality will succeed truthfully. And there's lots of areas where I haven't, there's a couple small areas where I have, and that's what people know me for. And I'll continue to, you know, I pull on that string of interest and passion. Like mindfulness is such a passion for me. It's a very niche passion, but it is for me. Um, but it's really opened the doors, you know, uh, successfully for myself. Well, I, I do want to add that your brand of mindfulness is a very different, um, refreshing brand. You know, I think of you, honestly, at least one of the uh, faces of, of new mindfulness. And by that, I mean, it's like, I think I, I feel like mindfulness can kind of could use a, I feel like a a reputation upgrade because there's a lot that it makes me think of like the gauzy pinks and purples and uh, you know, not to be ageist, but older people, like real, like older people, and yeah. and I'm I'm older, <laughs> so talking about you know, people even older than me, um, but just uh, that feels kind of dusty and dated. And when I think about um, even how on your podcast you intersperse it with, I want to get the name right, um, music uh, by Mindfulness. I was totally vibing to that. Um, that it's like you're bringing this mindfulness me mindfulness message in these bite-sized pieces in ways that are fresh and relatable. And it just, it feels like for people who are like, I don't know about mindfulness. Like it just, that feels kind of like new agey and not for me. I mean, I'm just, just saying like, you know, check out case because his brand of it is, is modern and relatable. And I, I honestly, as somebody who has meditated on and off over the years, I do feel like our industry has done a disservice for, meditation because if you don't if you don't find kind of the meditation that works for you then i mean how many times have you heard people say i can't meditate yeah right and it's like and then they give up and then they feel frustrated so it's just it, it yours is a is a refreshing approach so thank you for that well i really appreciate that and it's like really important to me because my whole thing is like in my 20s, I was a skeptic for sure. Like I would laugh at inspirational quotes and I, I would it literally, from what you're saying, I would think about mindfulness or meditation. I would be like, well, that's for other people. That's for people who know what a chakra is or talk about vibrations and energies who wear lots of robes and lotions and candles. I was like, that's for those people. Good for them. Really what I've realized and is crystals. that- And crystals. A lot of crystals. And crystals. Oh yes, that's <laughs> very important. Uh, you know, what I've realized is when I think about mindfulness, and you know, there's so many different definitions of mindfulness. I don't think there's ever one that's wrong. Um, but typically, when I think most people think about mindfulness, we think about some element of being present in our emotions, accepting our emotions. So mindfulness through meditation or through whatever mechanism, we think about mindfulness as this tool to know ourselves and to be present in how we feel. I think that's tremendously powerful and is an essential component of a life well-lived and is mindfulness. But I, the the... the the area of mindfulness that I gravitate towards is mindfulness is also learning to talk to yourself. And that's why when you see my quotes on Instagram, that's what I'm doing. I'm helping people retrain their inner dialogues and their narratives so that they can talk to themselves. Mindfulness on its own, when it's just listening, I think we're missing half the battle. And I think oh, that's why a yeah, lot of people are you. turned off from it. Because I mean, think about your thoughts. If I, if I only listen to my thoughts, I'm going to go nuts because... There's also a lot of great thought leadership on thoughts and consciousness. Like a lot of the time, it's not even us. We're just receiving it. So we can't just only listen to ourselves. At some point, we have to take a step forward and talk to ourselves. And to me, I think 
people really gravitate to that once they realize that fact because it's more lean forward it's more active it's not this passive endeavor it's not just sitting it's it's more verb it's more action focused so that that leads me to the question that i have about this so i was looking at your instagram and you have a video where you're posting up a poster and it says something like um don't let the people who aren't moving forward at your pace pull you back and I always think that's so interesting. And I've definitely lived by a similar motto at different points in my life. But I do wonder, like, is there a degree to which sometimes we are encouraging people not to challenge themselves in those moments? Like you're saying, just listening to the inner thoughts. Do you think it's possible that sometimes our inner thoughts are leading us to become like maybe believing we're a little superhuman or really led by ego or sort of like, it's not me, it's all of them who aren't progressing like I am. Like, how do we prevent that from happening? Yeah, it's a, it's a, a great question. I mean, I think a lot of life is led by ego. Um, I mean, you talk to Ryan Holiday and he'll say ego is the enemy. Stoicism is notoriously anti-ego. Uh, and I would I would agree. I think it could take a long time to understand the different sides of your consciousness of your of your thoughts, some of which are led by comparison, which I think is a is a big time catalyst for for that ego. Um, but I don't know. Like I'm a I'm a a fan of words like ego and audacity and delusion, like these things that have become a bit cliche in this day and age. But I think we need a little bit of that. I really really think we do because it gives us the the catalyst to try things, not from a place of being better or wanting to beat people or anything like that, but like. We have to have a catalyst for making inroads that might be different. I mean, because the whole reason I wrote That's Bold of You was I just find it so easy in life to live in the gray, which is what I kind of refer to as where we're just we're just doing what we're told. We're doing what our parents have checking expected boxes. of us. We're, we're checking boxes. It's just so easy to do that. When you have a little bit of ego, a little bit of audacity, that's when you could break free of those. And then you need the, the counter side to that, of course, which is humility uh, and presence and challenge yourself. And, you know, I think the, the reality of mindfulness is like mindfulness is so powerful because it like it updates your operating system. Like if when you're 20 and then 25 and then 30 and 35 and 40, 45, if you're not like every single year challenging yourself and asking yourself the same questions, you're likely no longer living your version of truth. You're likely borrowing. You're likely living borrowing or you're living a, a former version of yourself. So like we have to update ourselves. And that's why I think my infinite as a practice is so important. And perhaps in that process, you would also reveal that at one point you were striving for this because your ego said you need this because it'll prove that you're lovable or whatever it is. And then through time and through learned wisdom, you realize, well, I don't need that. That comes from within. So you what know, are some of uh, those questions that you ask yourself? Like when you think about like, just to make sure you're staying on track, you're, you know, you said, geez, if you're not asking these questions and you may be, you know, borrowing somebody else's idea. So what are some of those questions that you challenge yourself with? Yeah. Uh, I mean, some of them are, are very action driven. So like most of the time, if you were to ask someone like, oh, like, like a very simple, like, what do you want out of life? It's a good question, right? Like, what are you trying to do? Most people say like, I want I just want to be happy or something like that. Um, I think those are really tricky because it doesn't allow you to say, well, what is happiness for me? It doesn't say like, what is success for me? And then we end up chasing money or, you know, whatever, maybe. So like, I really try to pivot it back to the question I ask myself very often. And especially in my journaling practice is I'm the kind of person who, and then I force verbs on myself. Like, what are the things that I do that would make me happy? Or that would say, if I do these things, I will be successful or confident or whatever. I think, you know, auditing yourself with the things you do, not just the, the adjectives you want to have, that's the real breakthrough there because we get lost. So it really in the it defines so your, it's, it's kind of defines your identity. It reminds me of, um, is it J, uh, the guy that wrote Atom Atomic Habits, James Clear? James, it's it's literally a habits for, habit formation tool when you, you identify the, by things you do, not the outcomes you want. Yeah. Right. As, as a, as a runner or as a cook or as a, you know, as a kind person. And it's like you identify, you use those um, identifying traits and verbs. And then, and then it's almost like the, uh, the behavior follows, which is, which is great. Right. Cause I, I take your point that if you make it too broad and things that are pretty um, ambiguous, like happiness or success, that that can come in a lot of ways. Uh, Joanna, what, what's up? Yeah. You mentioned delusions earlier that <laughs> that in reference to your book and, and that's bold of you that 
how can we make our delusions work for us? Well, I, I think having them grounded in a why that actually makes sense for you. Like, is the like, it's easy to hop on social media and we'll be like, be delusional about making seven figures. I was like, okay, whatever. Like, the, those things fall apart so, so quickly and is borrowed. So, I mean, I think at the end of the day, it always comes back to why are we doing anything in the first place? What is the draw for us? Like, why? Um, and I think it could take a long time to, to figure those things out. I think for me, like, you know, a question like, what, a, what is my purpose in life? Such a big question. I've always struggled with answering that question because we're so apt to just borrow other people's answers. So I've thought a lot about we're like- we're apt how to can... limit ourselves too. Like it feels even worse. egotistical yeah. to say, so Andrea and I have both written books. You've written a book. We're all authors. It is delusional to think I'm going to be a published author. It feels delusional and it makes me, I'm sure you both can relate. Sometimes you want to limit because it feels crazy. So you probably have to speak kindly to yourself. Like, why am I limiting that? Yeah. Yeah. Guardrails are like oddly comforting because it's like, well, I, you know, I just belong here and this is what the universe will allow and I can't go outside of it. And sometimes we like limitations, like limitations are, are comforting in that sense because it doesn't allow us to have that little doubt that says maybe more. I just find like, you know, in like a journaling practice, I lead a lot of guided journaling sessions for, for communities and, and corporate groups. And one of the ones that I always like to do is a super simple question, but it's kind of the reverse way to answer the question of what is my purpose in life? And the way to do it is to say, what don't I want to regret? Because I think of all the emotions in life that we're apt to borrow, jealousy, envy, definitions of success, timelines, confidence, all these things that we just copy. Regret is one that I don't think we ever borrow someone else's regret. We might look at it and be like, yeah, no, I, that, regret, I, I love that. That when I was reading that in your book, it was like, Ooh. And I, I mean, my answer as again, triple type a Aries working mom, my immediate answer is I don't want to regret not having more time with my kids because I work way too fricking much. What, what, what do you not want to regret case? Yeah, I think that's changed a lot uh, over the years. I mean, I, I think for me, a lot of it comes down very, very much so to some of the tactical. Like, I don't want to regret not writing as many books as I can. I believe so much in the written word and in the physical manifestation of wisdom. Like, to me, um, you know, that's really big. I think, you know, I think being cringe is like a big part of <laughs> my identity. I sound like a clown when I say that, but like, I don't want to regret, you know, trying to play it cool and then being that guy. So, you know, I think a lot of my my life has spilled over into the creative realm, which to me is so rewarding to be able to just manifest a lot of things that are important to me: success, confidence, alignment, um, you know, connection, relationships through creativity. So for me, that's big. But like the idea of of regret is because to your to your point, it's like you either regret something or you don't, which is why I think it's such a powerful barometer for whether you're borrowing something or not. So looking at life through that lens, I think, could be really powerful. Yeah, it's a it's a cool ninja move to think um, in, like almost in in reverse. And I just I encourage everybody who's listening just to either now or, you know, pause what we're saying or right after this um, session is over, episode is over, just to really sit down and think, what do I not want to regret? Right. Because it is a it is a sharpener for sure. But let me ask you this. As somebody who has gone through, oh, gosh, I feel like so much heartache. As, as a people pleaser and somebody who was trying to prove themselves and overachiever. I mean, honestly, your book really spoke to me. And I was like, oh, God, it's just what I need now. <laughs> you know, like like it or not, right? How, how the universe will, will do that. I love how lighthearted it is and actionable and things like um, you'll say things like, you know, be cringy. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, that's so so cute and fun and gives permission. And yet, especially we have teenage children. Both oh, of yeah. Us, oh, so. I love to be cringy. Just, we yeah. live in the cringe. <laughs> you lead by example. Right? Just, Perfect. Just yeah. to spite them. No, but in all seriousness, I mean, I think I literally tell myself I cannot blink. I need to walk into the flame. Right. Because when I think about like when it get, you know, it's like on the one, one hand, you can like speak up for yourself and you can do some of these things that are at the margin. Helpful. And yet when I think about real authenticity, and let's face it, authenticity is a buzzword that has been thrown around a lot. But when I think about myself and really being true to myself and really being bold, whew, dang, I mean, it, it's brought me to my knees, honestly. 
And I, again, I appreciate your, it's like you're a wonderful companion along the way and, and you've provided some great, um, you know, frameworks. It's like, hey, what do you not want to regret? And um, where I want to get back to, is it um, Mitsugi about like the big, bold thing? Did I get that oh, word wrong? yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. we'll come back to that, right? So there's some really cool, really wonderful frameworks and nuggets that you have. But I, I guess I, I'd love to understand, I mean, have you felt like you've had to walk into the flame in all of this and had to say to yourself, Case, you can't blink? Or has it been a series of a little bit easier and more gentle uh, ways of becoming bold uh, and true to yourself? Uh, yeah. I mean, I think that I've certainly, there's been some points in my life where it's been big, bold moments. I think leaving my career behind was a big one. Um, okay. But I think otherwise it's I mean, been just did it scare like... the crap out of you? Because ultimately, when yeah. we're talking this stuff that really gets to your identity and all the freaking things we do to protect ourselves, I think of like peeling back the masks, and I say masks with two S's, because it's like, it's, it's never just one, right? And these whole, like really deep um kind of holistic shifts it, it is more than just just speaking up that one time you know what i mean and so i you know I, I really like when i think like really making that wholesale change and really being true to yourself i mean i i you know and maybe it's just me when it's like oh frick that's that is really scary because it does come to our identity i just I'm and curious. there's a lot of shame in that well, yeah, we have a lot of shame mixed up with that well, stuff yeah, too. And, and back to like guilt of of not not being more true to myself earlier right it's like why wasn't Aww. i more true to myself so any does any of this resonate or yeah oh this is this is all i think about this is all i think <laughs> okay, about. I, yeah i mean i think there's a lot there i think i you know i, I think in a couple different ways i think for one like making some big moves in your life is like a snowball effect like you quit your job that is like, well, I quit my job then I can go introduce myself to a stranger. I can go, you know, shoot my shot. I, like, you, so a big move in your life, whether that's leaving a relationship, a job, standing up for yourself in a big way. Um, I think certainly that that's a, could be a great catalyst. It was for me. I mean, leaving my job was a big moment for me. I come from a very traditional career, uh, focused family. I remember my mom didn't mean anything by it, but I remember when I left that job, she was like, Oh, you're throwing that all away. I was like, oh my gosh, am I throwing it away? Like I invested a lot of time and I was successful to start over. Um, I think though it becomes a lot easier. You know, we talk about goals, right? We talked a minute ago about saying, I want to be happy. It becomes a lot easier when you replace language and goals like that with, I want to be proud of myself. I am, my goal in life is to be proud of myself. And being proud of yourself comes from making promises to yourself and keeping them. And you do that enough, your actions will follow and inevitably they will be bold and they will be aligned and they will be truthful to yourself. So I think a lot of this comes from the core of making promises to yourself. Promises likely, to your point, came from experiences where maybe there is a little guilt or shame because you didn't do it. So talking about a promise like I will no longer put up with disrespect in a relationship or I will not sit, stick in a relationship that is one sided, things like that. But it has to come from somewhere, which is OK. Then you make the promise and then you keep the promise and you're proud of yourself and you move forward and those are bold actions. So, you know, a lot of mindfulness, when I think about mindfulness, mindfulness isn't just like, oh, I'm present in my emotions. It's oftentimes like you're an attorney and you're saying, okay, here's the evidence from my past. Here is the experience and here is the verdict that comes from it. Examine the truth and here is the new promise. So a lot of it is like I have lived through A, I believe B. I lived through B. I've lived, I be, have believed C for so long. I no longer will. Like a lot of this, like sifting through our emotions and our experiences to come up with better promises for ourselves, um, I think can go a long way as far as motivating you in the present. And then you can start adopting little tactics like, you know, uh, who is it? Mel Robbins has like the five second rule or 15 yep. second rule or 18 mm -hmm. second rule, however many seconds it is. Like it's like 5,000 seconds. It's a really yeah. long thing. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a, it's, it's a marathon session, but like whatever, come up with something that yeah. just inspires you to keep yeah. a promise to yourself, to act, whatever it is. There's a lot of different psychological things you can lean on, but as so, core, it comes back to promises. So Case, you said something a while back that I cannot stop thinking about, which is you had to take the risk of not seeming cool. And that is a hard thing in our society for men that you guys, there is a lot of pressure on you guys to seem unemotional, tough, like you've got it all figured out. You guys are taught from a young age, especially, you know, you're a millennial. If you're 
I think you probably feel that pressure. Generation X feels it so much to be tough, cool, analyzing yourself in the ways that we've been talking about. Like, that's not cool. That's not manly. And that has done a big disservice to men in our society. So like being kind of a typical cutie pie, muscular, manly man doing this, do you feel like you're paving the way for other guys? And is that in your mind when you're creating your content? Well, I appreciate that, certainly. I think for me, it's not like, you know, for me, it's it's easy because at some point I flipped the switch where I was like, it feels good to be honest with myself and with other people. And it does not feel good to not be that way. And a lot of men who have, you know, you know, cooped up their emotions and are acting in, in ways that don't honor themselves and disrespect other people. If they were, if they started to be honest with themselves, they would realize how bad it feels on the inside and how good it feels to just be honest, no matter if it doesn't make you cool. So I made that decision to be like, I just want to feel good on the inside, no matter what it looks like on the outside. And for me, it's always been super simple from there. Um, you know, I, I don't really see myself as like this, this beacon of hope for men. I am inspired though. I like, I will say I am inspired by the number of men who read and support and attend my sessions and, you know, do all the things. Um, they're just not as vocal as women, but I, I am inspired by the amount of men who do these things. They're just not as vocal about it. Like me and my like two best friends, for instance, like we've got a text chain where like we'll send back and forth, like, uh, photos of like journal entries. Like my friend Mike is really good at that. And it's like, it's, but it's not like a sappy little thing. It's, you know, it's just like something you do once you're at, on the same level as other guys, the guys who perpetuate whatever word we want to use, toxicity, immaturity, emotional lack of awareness, just something whatever. limited, self-limiting and unhealthy. Yeah. Though those guys just don't have the right support system that makes them realize that that kind of behavior just exacerbates that inner chaos that they likely have covered up in, in some way. So, you know, the, the simple cheesy answer is like you got to surround yourself with better people and this all becomes super, it becomes easy. It becomes much easier. How does a person do that? How does a guy start doing that? Well, well, I, I, I got the easy answer. The first answer is journal. I'm a big, big proponent of guided journaling, you know, you can't tell a guy to go to therapy. It's not going to work. Um, start journaling for one. There, there's a, there's a lot of reasons there that I can go on and on about. Uh, other than that too, it's like remove triggers. Like men are easily triggered, particularly in social media, remove the triggers that make you slide back and that'll help. Uh, the other aspect of a support system I think is super important, but I, I think it really is about, and as, as anyone struggles with male, male or female or however you identify, it's like at a certain point, you're chaotic because you don't have a belief system and you're struggling with that. You've either adopted someone else's, um, you, you've fit into some kind of stereotype. Um, you know, the idea of masculinity, for instance, as a topic is something I, I, I talk a lot about. I think we need to, we need to remove like, even like words like masculinity. Like I did an episode where I was talking about, you know, like from a woman's perspective, like a traditional woman who wants a masculine man I was like, well, stop looking for masculine traits because those are usually faked and they're performative and they're not real. Let's instead look for, and this sounds cliche, but it'll make sense. Let's look for a mature man because what is more masculine than a mature man? What is maturity? Maturity is someone who does what they say they're going to do. They're honest about how they feel. They show up when it's difficult. What is more masculine than that? We need to get away from these these words, even just like words. The, the nomenclature of masculinity, I think, is a, a reason why a lot of men fall into this, you know, I forget the book that was written, The Mask of Masculinity, the, into these like toxic roles that are we're literally LARPing. They're just playing. Um, whereas if we get back to like the core components of what makes a masculine man, for me, that would be more on the maturity an angle, but yeah. even like the words someone we once use said, important. like the someone once said, the opposite of man is not woman; it's little boy. And I, it really reframed the way I saw it. And and I'm with you that when we're saying like toxic masculinity, we're really like putting a cloud over this thing that is not dark; it's neutral masculinity, like you're saying. It's neutral. It's what you do with it. Yeah. Yeah. And like then to my point about like men being triggered, like, well, you know, men who really haven't done the self-examination, they'll hear something like 
toxic masculinity and they'll be like, well, I just, you're not letting me be a man. And, you know, then it becomes this like hateful, spiteful rhetoric. But to your point, let's, let's come back to something that doesn't have to do with man or woman or masculine or feminine. Let's, let's define those traits with things that are more relatable that we can actually take accountability for. And I think conversations become much easier and less dress up. Um, and you know, they just well, make more I, sense. I want to jump on the, your point about the maturity. I mean, I think that's same for men and for women. Right. I mean, so when you think about uh, um, what makes an attractive partner, it is it is maturity. It is self-awareness. It is being reliable and all of those things that I feel like um, if if they haven't been um, modeled to you and, and for a lot of people, they haven't been modeled. Well, then that's that's our jobs to figure it out. And I, I reminded of one of your um, clips. I think you said are you attracted to a type or a pattern? And I, you know, I feel like probably a lot of people are attracted to immaturity because that's what they grew up in. And you talk about chaos, right? The chaos of like, if you haven't learned it, you know, something is off, but you continue to live that pattern because that's what feels familiar and comfortable, even though it's not right. But, and, and I want to link that back to I love the themes of your book. I really do. In fact, there are a couple that I do want to get back to before we we wrap up. But when I think about this idea of um, saying, hey, I'm going to march to the beat of my own drum and I'm awesome and, you know, and I'm going to be cringe and all those things. Do we risk being in a little bit of an echo chamber, right? Because, I mean, we're social creatures and yes, our society can be really judgmental. I mean, it, the extreme obviously is cancel culture and oppressive and if you don't fit, you know, then like everybody else's norm, then you have a problem. But I also worry if we're not getting the social cues and if we say, hey, I'm just going to be me at all costs, do we, you know, do we do we sort of risk being in this echo chamber where we're not getting the social cues and we find, yes, I think I'm hot um, and I'm going out and being my, you know, kind of brightest, cringiest self. And I'm like, shit, this I'm I'm failing. I mean, there there's a danger in that, it feels like. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I, I'm a I'm a big proponent of keeping things balanced and keeping ourselves honest. Like I, I, I sit on the line sometimes between a bit of uh you know, optimism that is somewhat blind. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think there is a certainly a danger, and you see it on social media a lot with people be like, I am the prize. I, I am. And it's like, cool. love the optimism, but let's break it down. Why? What are, like, what are we doing here? Where's the evidence? So I think we really do need to start, keep ourselves accountable. For instance, I released an episode this morning on the podcast about how to deal with unsure people, people who are unsure about you, right? They don't say they don't want to date you or they don't want to be your friends, uh, but they don't say they do. They're on the line. All the social media advice will say, no, you walk away from unsure people because you are champagne and they drink tea and, and blah, 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 blah. And, and don't get me wrong, I, I, I'm a big fan of that. I'm a big fan of standing up for yourself and optimism and leaving behind people who can't give you what you want and opening room for people who can. But the whole episode was before we get to that step, we're going to do the step that we don't like to do, which is ask ourselves, for instance, when you're dating someone and they're unsure about you, have you showed up as your best self? Has enough time passed where you showcased yourself? And have you been honest with them about what you want? The majority of time in my life, when I have instances of people who have been unsure about me in post connecting the dots, it was because I was doing something silly, playing games, hot, cold, some kind of mind game. They're unsure about me because they thought I was unsure about them. I played a huge role in that, but the whole rah, rah social media of I'm the best, it blinds us to that. Well, totally. Oh, thank you. And I think that that business of being sincerely accountable and, you know, just rewinding to the previous part of our conversation where, where we really are accountable. And that's, I, I think of relationships as this wonderful forge, if we're willing to be honest, because we are getting the feedback and it's, you know, it is a, an opportunity to see our blind spots if we're being honest and that, and if we're asking the right questions. And I do feel like that's where, to your point, some of these social media messages can be, Hey, I'm, I'm champagne all day long. And, and I persist in my blind spot and, 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 and it's, I've really, um, um, forsaken a chance to grow and see those parts of myself that are not so champagne-y. 
right? I, yeah, I just saw a meme and I thought of actually both of you. We talked about you yesterday in a meeting, in case I don't remember just walking around thinking about Oh, yeah, no, we're talking about you all day long on 24 7. So we gonna talk keep about going. Gonna keep case going. Kenny. No, but I saw this meme just before we logged on that said, um, and it was lovely, and I do mostly agree with it, which was, um, um, stay with the person who makes you feel at peace and essentially leave the person who pushes your buttons and triggers you. And it brings me back to not just what you guys are saying, but also the the leaders in, in relationships, the Gottmans, Harville and Helen, all of these people will say, the person who's right for you may still we'll push your buttons. Push your buttons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the, that's the, I mean, that's the rub, right? That there is something that we have brought forth that, uh, somebody else is pointing out those blind spots and either we can ignore them and go from relationship to relationship or or use that opportunity to, yeah. to get real and be accountable and about ourselves. If we're like, you're supposed to bring me peace, that's what you're supposed to do. Therefore, you're the wrong person. We're probably not going to be able to have long term relations or even long term intimate friendships because that that person's my friendships, my best friends will be like, you're out of line. And it well, is I feel like that's where that maturity comes from, right? I mean, so to the extent that the we we each and we're e if we're each responsible for bringing maturity to the relationship, then it feels like we have a a better shot at seeing those blind spots and helping each yeah, other. And there's the balance blind spots. Mm -hmm. because we also don't want someone that is like triggering us on pur on purpose. If we go too far in either direction, you've got a mess. Yeah, yeah. I I mean, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think. We'd be remiss to think that like your perfect partner will never hurt you, will never say something triggering, like all these things that social media has made it so easy for us to be like, be gone at the first sign of any disruption. And yeah, I mean, humans are confusing. Like not only are we subconsciously addicted to familiarity and usually the negative kind of chaotic upbringing driven familiarity, but we're also just like hypocritical, like one moment where like I am bold I go for what I want and then the next we go I only match energy like I match your energy and it's like these things are so at odds with each other that it just it ruins our chances of of uh take taking advantage of our ability to be bold so yeah yeah <laughs> yeah as with everything it's about balance it's about a enormous weight placed on self-accountability as the catalyst for allowing yourself to then be bold and do these things and actually make the most of it. But we have to take care of ourselves first and we can't be hypocritical in, in the ways that we're talking about so here. So just in the spirit of keeping it real, ha has there been a time recently where you've had to call yourself out for being hypocritical? Oh, yeah. All the time. <laughs> All the time. He's like, just I mean, now. I really didn't oh, mean anything I'm, I'm I just sure. said. I mean, if, if I had more time, I'm sure I could think yeah. for a moment absolutely yeah. all the time i'm talking to my girlfriend about how like you know mm -hmm. <laughs> do what i say not what i do at all the time yeah yes yeah no it's just so refreshing because I, I do think you obviously have all these you know millions of fans including john cena which i'm really curious about <laughs> like how like you know like gotta come back to that but it but this idea of uh, of um keeping it real right where it's like we're all i think m most of us for the most part are really trying our best and it's so hard i mean back to the point i was making a few minutes ago to you know to have that courage to really look at ourselves i mean that takes real courage i mean and to say frick i'm being a hypocrite that takes courage but it's what you were saying a few minutes ago too that being honest with ourselves is what sets us free and that's, I, you know, that's the I feel like podcasts have kind of changed the culture around it, not just men, but also women, but especially men around our ability to really be honest about it. Like you mentioned John Cena as a fan of yours. Um, I heard him on Armchair Expert and I had no feelings about him. I felt nothing. No, no, not negative, not positive. Lovely person. I heard him on there and he opened up about his insecurities, his body image, what it's like to have to be the biggest guy in the room. And it's like to understand the depth at which every other person or pretty much every other person is experiencing something like that. What a gift, especially for men that look at him and he's able to be like, oh man, I was lost for yeah. a while. Yeah, it feels good to do that. I mean, I'll give you two other male examples that you would not think of people who have supported me and, and post my stuff. So John Cena was one, Snoop Dogg was another, and then uh, Conor McGregor was another. So these are like masculine fighters, 
superheroes and you know rap and r&b icons um so yeah i mean you know who know that i think that that's great and that's obviously nice to see them share my work but it's also i think much more indicative of the larger picture which i think you know we're coming around i think we're in a bit of a mindfulness renaissance here which is great which is that for all the ways that we bemoan social media i think it really has normalized a lot of these conversations and most importantly it helps people feel seen i think that the moment that people feel seen by others and also by themselves. Cause I think a lot of time there's this big disconnect between ourselves and how we see ourselves. I think that that could be it. That could be the catalyst for all, all the growth and things we're talking about here. But I think it's a good time to well, be alive. I, I think just, yeah, just to add on to that, I feel like that business of being seen and feeling like, okay, I'm not alone in my feeling like a hypocrite and telling that hard truth. And that, you know, I think that is the gift of uh, you know, to your point, the toxic, uh, you know, let's face it, social media can be a toxic place and it can be this beautiful place of communing and keeping it real and saying, here's how I messed up and here's how I forgave myself. And and then, I mean, what you do and what we're doing is like giving people permission to be human, right? And that that feels like the great gift of, I mean, pot, to your point, Joanna, of these kind of podcasts. Um, but let me let me circle back to a couple other ones especially for the uh, single people out there, um, single and, and looking to be paired. Um, you talk in your book about who cares the least wins and you rail beautifully rail against that. And I just, just talk about that for a minute because this idea of like, hey, you're the most chill, you're the most nonchalant and that's cool. And you're like, what are you even talking about? Like whoever cares the least doesn't win. Just, just for the single people out there, give us, yeah. give us the advice. Well, yeah, it kind of goes, it kind of riffs on what I said earlier about the I match energy thing. Whoever, you know, cares less wins. The whole catch flights, not feelings crew. It's this this weird mentality where it's like, yeah, I'll, I'll follow your lead. And and the reason it's so interesting, it could because it's, it's very reverse logic somehow. We think that doing that protects us. We think that, okay, I'm just going to chill and see how committed you are. And then if you're committed, I'll follow suit. But we think that that gives us more power, right? Because we're like, I am going to wait. I'm going to wait for evidence. We think that gives us more power, but it literally does the opposite. It strips us of our power when we're always waiting for someone else to make the first move. It makes it makes no sense. You can't I mean, create does, anything. It, yeah, it, like it makes, it, it does make sense. Like I've got a lot of empathy. It makes sense that we're doing this from a place of, okay, once before I made the first move, I was the most energetic. I was the most into it. I caught feelings first and then I got really hurt and I'm no longer going to do it. So like, we have to understand this comes from a place. This isn't just like a mentality that we woke up with, but it does not accomplish what we think it accomplishes, which we think it gives, we think it gives us more power and we think it protects ourselves. It does the literal opposite. Um, and that's not a particularly easy pill to swallow because it probably does open you up to being rejected to swing and missing, to shooting your shot and being left on red. Um, but I mean, I think, again, you've got to do a little weighing of those realities. Which one are you going to regret more? One where you give away your power, uh, one where you're always waiting for permission, or one where yeah, sometimes you're not meant for certain people and it stings and then you move on. It's up, it's up yeah, to you to I, make I'm that. a big advocate of being the person to go first, right? And I feel like there is an inherent power in that and and in the best way and it's like okay you've gone first and if it's not going to work now you know and you don't have doubts um and if i think if you go first with maturity and compassion and you know all those things it's like all right now you know now i've given myself that shot versus wondering whether um you know like neither of us was willing to go first and now now we never know you okay, got to build something when you do that you got to make a foundation all right, the other couple of quickies. I love how you urge people to disappoint, and this is for the people pleasers out there, not to disappoint for disappointment's sake, but to be willing to let others down, which is something I've struggled with. And I like how you literally say, I want to see the receipts, right? And I say, and and you're you you talk about like, you know, you're not doing it just just to do it, just to be a flake or ghost or whatever, but this idea of saying, in 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 the spirit of being true to yourself you say no you do whatever or or you you know whatever it is that causes somebody to feel disappointed or let down but in as a practice of 
being true to yourself. And I feel like a lot of us, particularly women, but I'm sure there are a lot of guys too, we say no when, uh, or we say yes, we mean no. We don't want to disappoint. And I just, I love it that you're saying, give me, you know, like get the receipts for that. Like get the evidence for doing these things because that then becomes like a habit. Like, you know, we were talking about habits earlier. If you do it in, in really in honor of yourself, it becomes an opportunity back to being true, right? Which is what, that's the give, best gift we can give to anybody, right? Is being true to ourselves, even if it means I'm going to disappoint you a little bit yeah. along the way, because yeah. I'm and playing it, the long game. Yeah. And it goes back to earlier. What promise are you keeping to yourself that results in you disappointing someone else? So that's like putting the period at the end of that promise sentence. So, I mean, it really makes it real. Yeah. I mean, I think allowing yourself to disappoint others is the key to being a chronic people pleaser, or I call them perpetual people pleasers uh, in the book. Um, and yeah, I mean, again, we think about mindfulness a lot as this like, oh, this esoteric spiritual thing. Sometimes I like even gamify it. Not that like life is a game and relationships or something a game, but like, I think I, I don't remember if I talked about it in the book. I wrote it a while ago, but like I even talked about confidence points. Like where does confidence come from? It comes from trial and error, mistakes, embarrassments, cringe. And anytime you do something where you're like, well, that was embarrassing, you give yourself a point. And like it's a country fair, you cash in those points for a teddy, but you have to cash them in for something. Same with disappointment. Like I, I think there's very few moments of success or connection or big rewarding moments that didn't come from disappointments. So again, you're cashing in those disappointments as signs that you're on the right track. You're keeping promises to yourself. It's a visual experiential representation, the receipts of that you're actually making promises that align with your true self. Well, and I feel like that, I mean, my big, like what's bursting outside of me is each of us can only do it for ourselves. And that is, I mean, I feel like in a way it's like stating the obvious, but if we can't wait around for somebody else to help us be true to ourselves, right? And and to your point, Joanna, you know, so often we are waiting for that partner to create the peace for ourselves. But the truth is that that is a the superpower that we give ourselves is being authentic, is being true. And it's a freaking major practice, right? It feels like the thing that stands in the way of authenticity so much of the time is that we don't like what comes up when we do that. Like you're not always in the place to live to your authenticity. I think about when I was 26 or whatever, and I think about if, you know, living into my authenticity may not have been the best thing to do, which is why I think combining that with what Case is saying, what do you want? What what do you not want to regret? It really helps give a direction to finding an authentic version of yourself because that default one, especially when you're younger or in a hard time of life, is not always cute. Yeah, but that's but that's part of it too, right? I mean, it, it's like yeah. you, you go through those things and and I think you're right that What's hard, you know, as I was saying before about walking into the, I mean, for me personally, walking into the flame, it means looking at those things that I've done or those perceptions of myself that are hard, but it's like, there's no way around. You can only go through, right? And that, and so by definition, there is going to be grief and loss. Go ahead. I, I'd add a point here. I, I recently did episode 600, which is a big milestone for the Woo! podcast. And Wow. Okay. Uh, yeah, six years, almost to the, to the day. Um, I was talking about how, you know, in general in life, like if you don't have self-examination, mindfulness, if you don't have a point of view on yourself in life, inevitably you'll end up just having what I call low common denominator goals, ambitions, and standards, right? It doesn't make you a bad person, but without a strong sense of self, you will inevitably go after the things that everyone else goes after. Money. I need to make money. I need to make money. I need to be in a relationship. I need to own these things. And that, it's just what you do. Right. You, it's just, you go fishing where the fish are, but you don't know why you're fishing in the first place. So like I I know that it, like we're, these are cliches and a little ambiguous, but like I really do think <laughs> back to the to the opening, like a, a sense of self is an antidote to so many of life's frustrations and anxieties that inevitably will will come your way. It doesn't necessarily rescue you from pain in life, but it enables you to navigate it so much simpler because you have that sense of self. And that gives you a timeline where you're not rushing, you're not jumping into things, whether it's a relationship or a job, you're not blindly chasing 
money or whatever these things are. I think it's great to chase money, go after it, have at it, but it has to come from an examined sense of self. And that comes with mindfulness and all the things we're talking about here. But I think there's a lot of power in saying, okay, these are low common denominator goals. Are they for me? Yes. Here's why. No. Okay. Let's make a decision from there. Yeah, no, I, I, I love that. And I think, you know, your version of mindfulness to me is um, categorically practical, right? And that's, it's, you know, and, and yes, it feels good too, uh, but it is a, it is such a practice. What, what haven't we asked you, Case? I know we're coming to the end here. Um, we've covered a lot, but is there, is there a message? Is there a, something that you're like, oh, hey, I gotta, I just gotta get this out before we wrap up? No, you you really gave me some great questions that enabled me to say the the things I'm passionate about. I mean, I think the the soundbite that I love to repeat that I think en- encompasses this nicely. I, I said this like a couple of years ago on the podcast that you know we're all looking for the right way to live life, right? And I always say that there's no right way to live life, but there is a wrong way, and the wrong way is to think that there's a right way, because in pursuit of the right way, we are inevitably choosing someone else's path and not figuring out our own. So you know, do with that what you will. I just found a lot of freedom when I broke free from expectations, whether that was career or relationships or timelines, like there's no right way. The wrong way though, is to think that there's a right way to think that there, someone else found the right way. And the only way for you to be happy, like they seem to be is to do what they do, dress like they dress, act like they dress, be a single person like this, be married like this, have kids, like, you know, those are all great, amazing things in life, but it has to come from a catalyst from you and you decide what's right for you. I mean, if you were to ask me 10 years ago what the right career path would be, it certainly would not be me. I joke that I share my feelings for a living. That's my career. I would have laughed (laughs) and laughed and laughed at that. I would have said, no, you've got to go into sales and work your way up. And then, you know, one day I'll be chief revenue officer at a, you know, fortune something and la-di-da. So giving yourself the gift of starting over, giving yourself the gift of reinvention and giving yourself the gift of saying this is right for me might be not right for other people, but that's, that's the gift of life. I think that's the like most empowering mentality you can live with. Yeah. Amen. And your book does such a beautiful job as a friendly guide to get people to do it. And I have, I confess I haven't worked with any of your journals yet, but I love, I'm a journal, journalist, no journaler, I guess journaler (laughs) also, but I love your idea of like doing kind of like guided, like doing journaling kind of guided and as a practice, because let's face it, so often we read a book and we go, oh yeah, I'm taking a few notes, so I'm going to practice that. But then, you know, life takes over. And so the idea of getting into your journals as a way to internalize this message that can lead to lasting change to me is amen. Okay, last thing I got, since we talked about your your mesmerizing blue eyes toward the beginning, if anybody has seen Case, if you're not watching, if you just look at an Instagram, you're like, oh yeah. So I was wondering if I could be the person to suggest a staring contest between you and Jay Shetty. Blue versus <laughs> green. <laughs> yeah, you've got a shooting gaze. Okay, yeah. I know. <laughs> Jay Shetty, we'll a, I, a are you down off. for it? You and you and uh, Case Kenny. That's blue, blue versus green. Who's going to win? <laughs> no, but you do have gorgeous blue eyes, if I'm allowed oh. to say that. Well, I've worked you. with Andrea a long time, and I was not expecting that to come out of her mouth. <laughs> I was like, I think I, I know what Andrea is about oh to say. Is everybody cringing right now? Because if you're cringing, I, see, I just won. Mission accomplished. I'm like, Mom, quit cringing. <laughs> I'm, I'm just doing what Case told me to do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Blame me for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you so much case i am so grateful for your appearance and wisdom on our show thank you thank you thanks so much for having me so good. Oh, wow love him he okay. is case is amazing joanna do you have a, a number one takeaway that you're going to apply to your life based on that conversation i really liked the idea of embracing our delusions you know that, mm-hmm. that you can have a, a big dream and try and shut down the shame that tells you it's too big. Amen, sister. That's what we're doing. I love it. Right. And to not, you know, not listen to that, the, the critic, that little voice that's like, you can't do that. Right. I look around. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. I mean, just to build on that. I mean, I think about what we're doing. I'm here with our show, Open Relationships and the broader Your Tango platform. And I just think there is so much room for more wisdom, more healing, more help. I mean, let's face it, we're in a world where 
there's a lot of hurt and heartache, you know, because at times I'm like, oh, like, but there's already Esther and Brene, like they don't, we, you know, there's a million podcasts, you know, why do, why do the, does the world need ours? And it's like, well, no, because there's still a lot of hurt and healing and opportunity to make an impact on people's lives. Um, I, I just, I feel like I come back to his, um, his central thesis about just having the, the courage to be really honest with yourself. And I honestly, I, I was very tempted to interrupt when he was talking about getting the rid of the word masculinity. I want to be like, mm, I'm not sure about that, but I was polite and patient and let him finish. And when he, when he pivoted to, you know, what I'd like to talk about instead is maturity, you know, as, as like the masculine trait, I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm down for that. And I just, I connect the dots between maturity and and honesty and being true to ourselves as a as a practice and you know like to me that's that's what we're all called to do but it's a, I mean as I said earlier it's definitely a lift for me um and it feels really heartening um to feel like I've got um companions on my journey who are like hey keep going right and and you know, do this thing. And here's what worked for me. So yeah, so I'm a fan. We have to talk about this if we have him back on to talk about men. But my I had this ex boyfriend who was really attracted to women who were taller than him and I was taller than him. So I'm five seven. He was like, maybe a quarter inch shorter. And he loved when I wore heels, because he was like, he loved. So you were like, why are you attracted to women who are taller than you? That's so unusual. And he'd be like, if you look at really successful men, they're often shorter than the women that they're married to. So he had so idealized the idea of being successful that he had like almost eroticized or fetishized that success meant overcoming. being with tall women. Yeah. So it was like he was so obsessed with how other people saw him yep. that it became his attractive like what he was attracted to because he so badly wanted to be seen as the short guy who's with the tall girl yeah it, because there's something about that like oh he must be so confident or he must be so cool and so sure of himself that he's with a taller woman that he almost like wore that as a badge like oh if i do that then it shows that i am yep. so if you're, secure like, look or whatever at, you know back in the day harvey weinstein was a literal walking troll that everybody hated, but his wife was a literal beautiful, tall supermodel. And it was like, how much power you have is represented by how much of a troll you are and how much of a fucking goddess your female partner is. And yeah. it's fucking weird. And he turned it into a fucking a identity. He did me a service by cheating on me because I was never going to be able to do that anyway. Well, thank, yeah, you don't want to end up with, with a guy like that. It's the best cheating story ever, though. So if we ever talk about cheating, y'all are going to love this story. Love to hear your cheating story. All right, let's see. Um, Brian, how about you? Do you have a takeaway from our convo? Yeah, my the one that really struck me was the uh, confidence comes from evidence. And that was like, I don't know if it's specifically a dude thing, but there is this sort of like, seeing is believing thing with guys a lot of times where it's like you've probably seen it too where like um you're trying to explain something to a guy and they don't believe you like they have to see it for themselves or whatever it is like there oh, is this yes, weird hello. like you mean mansplaining yeah. yeah well i mean not not mansplaining but like like they don't believe it unless they see it right man dubiousness like, um, yeah um so i like they kind of just like uh, uh flipped a switch where it was like um I, I understand that entirely where it's like a lot of guys' confidence comes from like, uh, oh, let's say they met a girl at a party and they kissed her or whatever. The whole next day, they're like, wow, I'm uh, uh, more confident now because this thing happened. I must be like X equals Y. Like I did a thing and now I'm like and then so like I, I get where some people might, you know, uh, work so hard and. Uh, especially in the alpha sphere, right? They work on their bodies and things like that, but then they don't 
see any uh, difference in like the way that women treat them because they haven't made a personality yet um, or whatever. And they're so they're still not confident. All this stuff about don't get therapy, go to the gym, whatever. It like it all kind of feels like it ties together with this whole like evidence equals confidence thing. And that's sort of why a lot of guys can get trapped in the cycle of like just hooking up with a bunch of women. And then that's how they get their ego. Right. Is like they're inflated by the people that they are dating or whatever. And, and that becomes addictive because it's never exactly. enough. Exactly. It's a black hole. Exactly. So there's a lot of, of guys like in the toxic kind of guy sphere where I was growing up or whatever, where that was literally it. It was like they were who they were hooking up with. Like the their confidence was directly resulted of the evidence of the, you know. So it was, I don't know. I I was like, man, I got to do some deep thinking on this one now. That that like sparked a whole thing in my brain. Well, the uh, the other one just, you know, he kind of blew me away about, well, men, men just aren't going to go to therapy. So just forget about that. I want to be like, but, but, but. And then uh, then it's like, but they can journal. And I'm like, all right, well, that's a good step in the right direction. So. And some men are going to go to therapy. Yeah. You know, of course. But but that's what he's talking about with the like, I almost agree where he's like, like, we almost need to rebrand masculinity. Like there is so much like stink on it right now or whatever that it's like <laughs> it's it's not masculine to go to therapy or whatever. So he's kind of right in that, like a lot of guys aren't okay. going to go to therapy because they don't see it as masculine. But well, and that's where it's cool that a guy like him who is really good looking, very, very like the guy's jacked, right? Very fit and. Oh, is he? You've been stalking his Instagram? Is he? Oh, yeah. yeah oh, it's do, obvious, Brian. Boyfriend. I do my research. Yeah. Okay. The, those um, biceps are right out there on that Instagram, too. Yeah, yeah. You're not missing it. Okay. No, no. Yeah, no. It didn't take <laughs> didn't take too much uh, scratching between the, you know, beneath the surface. No, but I say it with all sincerity. You know, he said he gets paid to share his feelings. And I think, like, that's amazing because we are in this time of, I think, pretty major social transition where for more men like him who are um, who are really successful, who have built a, a, this great platform, and it's like, yeah, you can believe him, right? Because he's done his work. And, and you know, so, so yay case. Okay, let's wrap it up. It's been another great episode of Open Relationships, Transforming Together. We would love your feedback. We'd love your advice. Who you would love to see on our show, please email us at openrelationships at yourtango.com. We love your comments. We love your feedback. Wherever you're getting your podcast, YouTube, iHeart, Spotify, let us know what you think. And thanks for tuning in.